Good afternoon, this is Schweitzer, and we are looking at Atomic Trends. Um, it's a little smart note page, um, walk through some of the main concepts. What you should understand likely is that uh, the Atomic Trends really are a way for AP to test your knowledge of atomic structure. I mean, the trends, they make them maybe more important than they are, obviously. Um, there's lots of good information here, but they use these a lot just to sort of test your understanding of how protons, neutrons, electrons kind of interact and form the atom. So that's our main topic is here. Some of the main trends we have here are basically the radius is probably the most, uh, one of the most common ones. Uh, so let's look at that one here. So um, what do we need to know about atomic trends, atomic trends in the periodic table? All right, well, okay, well, let's just kind of look at this here. There are a couple of different ver types of them. Uh, we have uh, radius, which is being shown here. So we have the radius is probably one of the most common, radius. All right, and we also have ionization energy. And, of course, um, that's... These are two of the most common. Um, like I mentioned, why they use them is just really for application of understanding the atom. Well, there's another one called electron affinity. Electron affinity. Uh, for one reason, uh, affinity is, is this is a less common one. Okay. Um, and we don't really talk about it too much, but basically it's the opposite of ionization energy. So these are the three main ones that you should be familiar with and working with in your brain with. All right, so here we go. Why do atoms get bigger as they go down the periodic table? That's a pretty important concept that you really want to you know, have. And here we're looking at, okay, simply energy levels. That's all you got to do. And you'd want to state that, you know, let's say sulfur is bigger than oxygen because sulfur has more energy levels than does oxygen. You should be fairly aware of the fact that this first, the, the energy levels pretty much match the rows of the periodic table. So here we have, if you did a Bohr diagram, one energy level, two energy levels, three energy levels. So you should really understand the fact that as we get bigger and bigger and bigger as we go down, okay? So you would simply state, okay, well, um, sulfur is bigger than oxygen because it has more energy levels. Um, this one has... Sulfur has three, and oxygen only has two. Here's an interesting one, common one. What about potassium versus potassium plus? Okay, well, potassium has is located right here, so it's got four energy levels. But K plus lost an electron, and that's super important to realize that we got the four energy levels here, but the last one only had one electron in it because it's got one valence electron. So potassium is actually isoelectric with argon. Argon. So this guy is actually bigger than this because this guy only has three energy levels. Okay. All right. Keep moving. Why do atoms get bigger as they go down the periodic table? Okay. Now notice that they get bigger as they go to the left. That's something that you might not be as intuitive on. It's like, okay, why is it? that it gets bigger as it goes to the left, okay? So we call this, is a, uh, it's called, a technical term for it's called the effective nuclear charge. How effective is the positive nuclear charge at pulling things in? Um, but I, I, you know, you can use this if you want. If you understand when we're all done, if you understand this term, then you can use it. But if you don't understand this term, then, then don't use it, okay? Because you'll use it in a situation where it's not, you're just guessing. So, rather than using this guy, we really want to use Coulomb's law. Okay? And you basically state that we have forgiven distance. All right? And, and when I explain the, how, the version of Coulomb's law, why this happens to Coulomb's law, when I explain it, that is the definition of effective nuclear charge. Okay? So, what it's saying here is that um, we have basically forgiven distance. Okay? We're adding more protons at, at a given distance. So as I, I add electrons, this guy is 
the nucleus is basically radiating out positive attraction to anything that's negative and any radius from it. So by adding an additional positive, yes, I add additional negative out here as well. All that does is pull all the electrons in. Okay. So the way you explain this is that you'd have increased protons in the nucleus, which is causing an increase in Coulombic attraction. Okay. And that would be pulling all energy levels. a little closer now the short the one the, the answer that gets marked wrong is you just if you just say ah oh, more protons more protons and eh, that's not gonna cut it okay you need to really preface that is is what you would you would do now you could say ah oh, it's got more effective nuclear charge that would be sometimes a way of doing this okay but I prefer to give it an explanation in terms of Coulombic attraction okay so now again if the energy levels you know fill up you know then we add another energy level so that's not effective nuclear charge because we're not at a given distance all right that that's 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 not the, that's not the same Okay, so now the nucleus, yeah, you add an, its attraction to this guy is stronger because I had another proton and another electron. Yeah, this attraction is stronger, but this one's farther away, so it's weaker. Keep in mind, Coulomb's law is force equals the char. The there's a there's an equalizing number constant here. Uh, the the charge on the proton on the nucleus, and then there's the charge on the other guy is a negative charge. So we have this whole charge is clumped into one piece. So that thing, that thing keeps going up and up and up every time you add a proton. This is where the, 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 the trends of the periodic table aren't really about the trends. They're about the interaction of the protons, neutron, uh, protons and electrons mainly. All right, so this guy here, all right, this guy is just really referring to the charge on the electron, one electron, just one, okay? Single electron charge. All right, so if I add another proton here and I add another electron here on the outer ring, here, let's put it on the outside ring, okay? This guy over here doesn't know necessarily that there's another electron there. All it knows is, oh my goodness, another proton popped up. Pull me closer, okay? So as I move down the periodic table to, the, to this direction, I get smaller, all right? because I'm adding more protons and I have more Coulombic attraction, tightening it down, tightening it down, tightening it down, tightening it down, but then all of a sudden I get the energy level gets full and I pop up here and boom, I get a bigger energy level because I would have opened up a new shell, okay? So you might say zinc, all right, which is located right here. First thing I do with any of these problems, I find them on the periodic table and I start analyzing what's going on with these guys, zinc and vanadium. In this case, zinc is smaller than vanadium. Okay, not a ton, right? Not a ton. Um, and aluminum here, aluminum's here, and argon is located here. So argon is smaller than aluminum. Now, there's going to be some exceptions here. It's a trend. If it was a rule, they would say that's yeah, the you know it's the uh, atomic radius law, but it's not. Okay, and as we've done some modeling, we know is that that, for example, maybe there's a slight variation here, here, um, slight variation between here and here. If you see something like this, you should look at your atomic structure and say, what's, what's happening with my atomic structure that might be referencing or explaining why this happens? We really, that's all we do is, okay, well, we have a slight anomaly here. You probably can't tell this. It turns out that a p orbital, I'll put it up here, a p orbital that is half full, tends to be a little bit different than when you start rematching back up. So that's kind of what's happening right here, okay? It, it just doesn't necessarily 
work as smooth when all of a sudden you gotta match that thing up to get a little jog in size. Or when we're going from here to here, or from here to here. Obviously, we're going from s orbitals to p orbitals. And if these show you data with a variation, an anomaly that's not working out normally with atomic trends, you want to reference, okay, well, that's probably because something's happening on the atomic structure level. So when you're looking at atomic trends, they can do two, they can really give you two types of problems. They can give you one that's correct and say, oh, give me a reference, they'll, they'll tell you the trend. You don't really need to even tell lots of times whether it's bigger or smaller, they'll tell you. And you need to give the, the explanation. So they'll give you a reason uh, as to why, and you would want to reference Coulomb's law, or they'll give you a reason why it's not working. They'll say, this is, this is what's happening in real life. Why is it not working? And you'd want to reference, okay, some sort of atomic structure model that that could be saying, well, there's a little, there might be a little variation here because there's, there's something changing on the atomic level. Um, and again, why do they do this entirely? It's just to get you to try and explain things happening on the atomic level. That's it. Okay. Um, and again, all these trends, they're just trends. Nothing's working perfectly. All right. All right. So, next thing here, did you know that fluoride is bigger than fluorine? Oh, okay. So now I didn't add any protons, I just added an electron. I'm telling you, this one's bigger. And the answer would be why? All right. So, and this is guy is going to be electron repulsion. And that's the key word, electron repulsion. So at electrons, again, Coulomb's law is what you want to describe it. All right, how do we explain this thing? All right, is that, well, Coulomb's law is the force of attraction equals um, an equalizing constant. And then we have... Um, the charge of one item times the charge of another divided by the distance squared. I don't know if I added this part on here on the last one, but this is the entire Coulomb's law, okay? And of course here, we're referring to two negative particles, okay? So this is the charge on an electron, this is the charge on an electron, and when you jam another one in there, they're getting all of a sudden a little bit too close. And as those charges get close, remember, incre uh, decreasing this guy here, okay, will cause this thing to go up. Now, this is a very small amount of change, okay, but it causes it to swell ever so slightly in this case. Okay. Um, all right, so in this situation, okay, I'm just going to kind of reference here now. Um, our general thought process before I go into this, um, what does what is the general thought process? I've now mentioned three different things. I've mentioned this example right here, okay? Energy levels, right? That's a big difference. You might see multiple uh, example, you know, greater than signs because it's a really big difference between one energy level and the next. Um, and then I mentioned okay, number of protons. Okay, make sure to divide this guy by the distance squared. I didn't put that on there because we're in the same energy level, so the distance is kind of similar. And then the next one I'll add here is this guy here with adding electrons. So whenever I, I have the general mind path to say, okay, number one, first thing I look at is energy levels. And that's, if there, is there anything different with energy levels? If there is, that's what I use to explain the answer. The next thing I do as I look at number of protons. And of course, in honors chemistry, kids, like, kids will just blow up more protons. And, and it, you just can't get that. It's not going to do you any good. You need to reference Coulombic attraction. Here, energy levels, really you're, you're, you're referencing the, um, the atomic structure. Okay. And then the next one here we're referencing would be the last thing. If, if those two are the, all the same, same number of energy levels, same number of protons, then the only thing different would have to be the electrons. Okay? And then we're looking at the electron repulsion is our, our next thing. And if you are having a clear understanding of how this works out, then this will just be boom, boom, boom as you go down. Okay? Crossing out options. 
So here we go. Just kind of start reviewing things a little here. What is the effective nuclear charge? Which of these two would be an example of effective nuclear charge? And in this situation, it would be this one. Okay. Um, if you say, you know, why is sulfur bigger than oxygen? If you say, oh, it's because of the effective nuclear charge, no, well, that's that's not gonna that's not gonna work. Okay. The effective nuclear charge is a is a positive adding more positive charge to the same energy level. So because you're not increasing the energy level, the nucleus is becoming more and more effective, is more and more effective to grab on to more and more electrons and sucking them in a little bit closer. And the attraction, the force is getting bigger here. Okay. All right. All right, how do I justify or explain my answers? All right, just talked about this. So here's a review of this guy right here. Take a quick moment, pause the video, and try it out. Okay. All right, so Na, Na plus. Again, you'd want to find out who you're isoelectric with. All right. Sodium is isoelectric with helium. Now, again, you know, I, I know it's the noble gas on our side, so it's just got to find it. But in this case, this guy is bigger, much bigger. Okay. This guy is much bigger here. Electron repulsion. This is number three. Third example. This one is number one. Okay, so I went pretty quickly through that. Um, they're, this, they're the same element. So here, ne neon, I, and then negative three, is actually isoelectric with helium as well. So e even though you gained electrons, you stayed in the energy level. Okay, this isn't the second, they're all in the same energy level. So this failed in number one, failed number two because they're both ne nitrogen, and then electrons. Ah, okay, that's my discriminating factor. And I'm not putting down all my explanations here, but you'd, you'd want to write something out. All right, nitrogen and helium. Okay, so nitrogen and neon, uh, they're in the same energy level. Okay, who has more protons? Well, the neon has more protons. So therefore, this guy is smaller. This would be an example of number two, which is effective nuclear charge or Coulomb attraction. That's what we want to say. N negative three and neon. Okay, so now, um, same energy level. Okay, this guy is isoelectric with neon. Okay, um, and then in this situation, they're in the same energy level. They have the same ah, protons, still protons. Yeah, even though we're NA of three, um, this guy has more protons. Same more electrons, but more protons. So this guy would be uh, slightly smaller. Okay, more Coulombic attraction um, at a given energy level. All right. Um, all right, addition of an electron to a gas phase silicon atom results in the release of more energy uh, than the addition of two addition of electron to a gas phase of a phosphorus atom. They're worried this up kind of weird. Um, what is the best explanation for the relative electron affinities? Now we haven't done electron affinity yet. It's reversing of uh, of the. Of the ionization energy, which we're getting to next, okay. But essentially, what we have here is a situation where we're looking at silicon, and then the next one over is phosphorus, right? Right here, okay. And I probably need to move this particular um, question because it's more should be maybe later on. But essentially, they're wanting this is an anomaly, okay? They want to know why is it that um, you know, something is changing here. Alright, so on this one, what you want to be aware of is that uh, we are now half full. Okay, we're going to be half full. And you just say, okay, um, you know, what could possibly be happening here? Uh, silicon's smaller. Well, I mean, adding protons this way, um, you know, it's, it, silicon should actually be Phosphorus should be smaller. Okay. Um, silicon's more electron. We haven't really talked about that yet. Silicon's added electrons to silicon is lower energy in the subshell than add, than the electron added to P. Okay. Um, that sounds unusual. You know, maybe the electron added to silicon experiences less electron electron repulsion than the electron added to P. Phosphorus. Uh, okay. So this is something that we've been talking about. So some of these problems are kind of unusual. 
and you're kind of grabbing to what we've been talking about. And that typically is what's going to be, but you got to look at that, okay? And I think uh, we might stop here because we've now. Um, all right, let's try one more here. Let's see if I got my. Okay. This is the last one of our atomic radius, so we'll end after this guy. Atomic, atomic number increases from 11 to 15. Uh, radii of elements. Okay. And they want you to say why. Well, first of all, you got to find 11, 15. Where is it on the periodic table? Um, so 11 is. A little dark in here. Check my periodic table out. Grab yours. So 11 is sodium, all right, and 15 is phosphorus, all right, so we have 11 is, this is going to be sodium, and 15 is phosphorus, okay, so we're looking for a situation where it just kind of gets smaller, it goes to the right, it's in the same energy, it's just going to, the radius is going to just um, get smaller. All right, we will stop there for the trend of atomic radius, and uh, we'll pick up on uh, some ionization energy next.